Y'all ready to get into it? All right, we are on a series about trying to explain the parables and get a better understanding about the kingdom and a better understanding of what Jesus was talking about when he said some of the parables that he said because he told his disciples it's not for them to understand, but I've given you understanding. And so we just want to dig into that understanding. Today I want to cover a very, very popular parable called the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. So if we remember this parable from our teachings in the past about wherever you grow up, man, this parable is about helping hurting people, right? It's about making sure that if someone has been abused that we would somehow come to their rescue. It's about anyone who is hurting and needs help. Well, that's our neighbor and we should help them. It's not a, It's about being not being self-righteous like the priest and the Levite who went by on the other side of the road, but like the Samaritan, we got to be loving people, right? Right. Yeah, maybe not. (laughs) Maybe not. It starts in Luke chapter 10. I think you're going to see something that the Lord showed me, and I was like, man, how do I miss that? 10.25. This is where it starts. It doesn't start with a parable. It starts with a question. And a lawyer stood up and put him, Jesus, to the test, saying, teacher, What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what's written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus said to them, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. 29, but wishing to justify himself, the lawyer said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So here are things we know about the person who is asking the question. He is a lawyer. And that word in the Greek means he is one who is an expert in the law of God. An expert in the law. An expert in interpreting the law of God. And the lawyer is presenting a test of the knowledge that Jesus would have about the law. And the lawyer wants to justify himself with this follow-on question. Those are things we know. So critical in this context is that the person asking the question believes at this point that he understands the law better than Jesus does. Therefore, he is capable of presenting a test. The person asking the question believes that he can successfully test Jesus. I don't know about you, but if you're trying to prove somebody, you don't ask the question you know they'll know the answer to. You ask a question that you think they don't know the answer to. And the first question is, the first question is, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And look at Jesus' response. And this is critical to understanding the parable. He says back to him, what is written in the law and how does it read to you? Not about you, but that's not the expected response. What do I need to do in inter- internal life? We would expect Jesus to say, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Instead, he says, wait a minute, what's in the law? What does it say to you, lawyer boy? <laughs> So Jesus understands, based on that response, that he is dealing with a person who interprets the law. And the lawyer's response is from the law. The lawyer is quoting Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And he's referring to Leviticus 19, which is an entire chapter on how to treat your neighbor, treating your neighbor well. So Jesus says, and I love this, I I cannot wait to get to heaven and ask God, can you please put me back in time and let me see how that works? went down. Because I think when Jesus responds to him and said, you've answered correctly, do this and you'll live, he's actually shrugging him off. Good answer, son. Go on. Do that. You'll be okay. So love God and your neighbor, and it's all good, and you'll have eternal life. That's what the law says. But then the guy presents a follow-on challenge. Okay, since you knew that, 
Who do you define as my neighbor? Let me ask you something. Did Jesus question him at all about who his neighbor was? Were there neighbors a part of the original test? Did the lawyer ask about loving God with all of his being? No, but now he's bringing up the neighbor question. So the implication is that the lawyer is good with how he loves God, but he wants to clarify the whole neighbor thing to prove that he's also loving his neighbor. The lawyer wants clarification on who is my neighbor. Why is he asking who is my neighbor? The scripture tells us why he asked the question. He wanted to justify himself. I want to prove that I got this thing. So I want you to define who my neighbor is. So I can also prove like these people know that I'm loving God, that I'm loving my neighbors. He's saying, I'm a Jewish lawyer. I have treated the people well by interpreting the law of God for them. Everyone around me knows me as a man of God. He wants Jesus to confirm for everyone listening that he is justified also in how he treats people. In other words, I've already met the qualifications for eternal life on both of these issues. Let's just get that out in the open. Then Jesus says this. When he says, who is my neighbor? Everybody say, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers and they stripped him and beat him and they went away leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road and he saw him and he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also. When he came to the place and he saw him, he passed on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion, and he came to him, and he bandaged up his wounds, and pouring oil and wine on them, he put him on his own beast, and he brought him to the inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii, and he gave it to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come back, I'll repay you. Then Jesus says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he, the lawyer said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said, go and do the same. Now, let me set the stage for what's going on. We're talking about Jerusalem. Jerusalem sits at a height of about 2,600 feet above sea level, and Jericho is 700 feet below sea level. So when it says he's going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, it's literally a downhill walk. It's 16 miles of of descending 3,300 feet, and the road is quite treacherous. I have been there. It's a place where the Wadi Kelt is. What is the Wadi Kelt? It's a valley between Jerusalem and Jericho that David refers to, except David calls it the valley of the shadow of death. Why does he call it that? Because it's deep, it's rugged, it's twisty, and it leaves plenty of places for people hide to ambush you on it. And so this is a very treacherous road. And so he's gone by this road and he gets mugged and beaten and he's lying on the road and two guys come by. Two guys pass him, Jesus says in the story. Jesus says one of them's a priest and one of them a Levite. Now that's interesting. You notice he didn't say going down that road a farmer came by or a carpenter came by or even a rich man came by or a doctor came by or an innkeeper came by or a poor man or a sinner or a widow. No, he's very specific in calling out that a priest and a Levite went down that road. What is a priest? A priest that's one that's offering sacrifices and the sacred rites at the temple. He's actually working at the temple, doing the work of God, handling the sacrifices, handling utensils, the labor, cleaning, putting out the, uh, the incense for the prayer. He's doing all of these things. And the other is a Levite. A Levite is of the origin of the Levites, in this case from Ephraim and Nasa, actually. These are people who help the priest. Interesting, a priest and somebody who helps the priest. And so we start to interpret this parable, and I hear people talk about, well, that explains it then. 
Because you see, if a priest were in Jerusalem, that means he's been at the temple and he's done sacrifices. And and the, uh, the law says that if he touches anything that's dead, he becomes unclean and he would have to go back. So as a priest, he's coming down the road. He sees this guy. He's afraid, hey, if this guy's dead and I touch him, I got to go back and I don't get to see my family. So I'm not going to, I'm just going to pass by him. And the Levite, well, he does the same thing. He's coming down that road and he sees him and he doesn't want to touch him because he's already been in his service and he's ready to listen to me. All of that, we can't assume because these are characters in a parable. They're not real people. They're characters in a parable. So I can't assume what they're thinking unless Jesus tells me what they're thinking. So for me to assume that the reason the priest didn't go by and help the guy was because he might touch something dead and become unclean and have to go back to Jerusalem is an assumption that will lead me down a wrong path because I'm trying to put my mindset to what's going on. But we can make an assumption based on the fact that he was a priest or a Levite. Just based on what he is, that Jesus didn't say a farmer, that he didn't say a rich man. He said he's a priest and a Levite. Why would that be important in the story if we don't know what they're thinking and why they walked around the man? Because it's important to the lawyer. Because the lawyer now hears that a priest and a Levite went by. Well, a priest and a Levite, those are people like the lawyer that know the law. These are people in God's service. They're leaders in the faith. So the Lord would be saying, these are people like me. Everybody say, like me. Like me. So Jesus chooses these two people because the lawyer can relate to them. It's like saying you're a home builder. Well, listen, an electrician and a plumber went down the road one day. It's like, man, those are my people. Those are my people. So who's the third person? A Samaritan. A Samaritan. The Samaritans are actually, and I think they get a bad rap because it doesn't get fully explained. The Samaritan is familiar with the law, but there's a catch when it comes to the Samaritan. The Samaritan is from northern half of Israel. Samaritans are created when the Jewish nation, mostly the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim, married the Assyrians in Samaria. Therefore, the Samaritans were a half-breed group of Jews. They married outside of the Jewish face with the Assyrians in Samaria. Now, Samaritans believed that the Jews should be worshiping at Mount Gerizim, not in Jerusalem. That's a huge point here because the Samaritan is saying it's very important that we worship God and we know the law because we're half Jews, even though we've married into the Assyrian race. But God, when he sent us into the promised land, said that I want you to uh, pronounce blessings from Mount Gerizim. Deuteronomy eleven twenty nine. The children of Israel have already entered the promised land at this point. But this is what he's saying before they get there. It shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it, that you shall place the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Abal. Again, I've been there. There's a valley between two mountains. One is Gerizim, one is Abal. God said, I want to take half of the tribes and I want to put them on Mount Gerizim and I want you to pronounce blessings from them. You can go into the word and you can read what all those blessings were. And then I want you to take half the tribes, and I want you to put them on Mount Ebal, and I want you to pronounce curses from that place. And so now this group of Jews is saying, this is a holy place. Mount Gerizim is a holy place. So they're worshiping. Do you remember the woman at the well who's talking to Jesus? And she says, your people say we should worship in Jerusalem, but my people say here. What she's saying, she's saying, I believe we're supposed to be at Mount Gerizim, and there's Jews that believe we're supposed to be in Jerusalem, but we're convinced it's Mount Gerizim. So why are they hated by the Jewish people? One, they have mixed with the Gentiles and intermarried with them. They've bastardized the line of the Jews. They're not worshiping where the Jews are supposed to worship. The Jewish faith in Jerusalem is saying you're worshiping God at the wrong place, and the Samaritan Jew is saying, no, you guys are worshiping in the wrong place. And don't forget that Jesus has a lineage that's not pure either. He has a lineage with Rahab the harlot in it and Ruth the Moabitess in it. 
So Samaritans are rejected by the lawyers, the Pharisees, the priests, and the Levites. Why? Because Samaritans don't worship where the priests and the Levites worship. Do you remember, we're coming from Jerusalem down to Jericho. So he's telling the lawyer that there's a Samaritan who doesn't even believe you're supposed to worship in Jerusalem is the one who stops. And the Samaritans considered the worship of the Jews at Jerusalem as illegitimate. Oh, come on. Here's the lawyer who is interpreting the law. And here's a Samaritan who says, you are interpreting it wrong. You're at the wrong place. You're supposed to be at Gerizim and you think it's Jerusalem. Now, notice it says they were going down on that road because they were coming from Jerusalem. And Jesus is making the point that this priest and Levite have been in Jerusalem at the temple. So here's the stage. The Samaritans are a personal assault against the role of the priest and the Levite. To even suggest that a priest, a Levite, or a lawyer should have anything good to say about a Samaritan would be preposterous because they don't know how to interpret the law. These Samaritans are directly opposed to the lawyer's interpretation of the law as it concerns where to worship. Now, I want to show you what Jesus does, because when I saw this, I'm like, I've been missing this thing the whole time. What was the question the lawyer asked? Who is my neighbor? Jesus responds by saying, which of these three proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? Oh, you missed it. The original question was, who's my neighbor that I am supposed to love like I love God? Well, of course we need to help those in need, right? Of course the poor guy in the ditch needs love, right? Of course you have to love your neighbor who's in need, right? That's not what he's saying. Jesus has twisted the story and told the lawyer, it's not the man in the ditch who you're supposed to help. It's the Samaritan. The Samaritan is your neighbor. It's not the one who's hurting. Oh, come on. Tell me you see this. Who is my neighbor? Jesus said, which one of these guys do you think was a neighbor? Oh, it was the Samaritan. What is he saying to the lawyer? You're all trying to prove you're loving the right guy. You don't love the Samaritan. The Samaritan is trying to justify himself that I love my neighbor. I'm going to prove it. Go ahead, Jesus, and identify my neighbor so you can say it's the people in the crowd. And I can say, oh, yes, I've loved them well. But have you loved the half-breed Jew who thinks you're interpreting the law wrong? Are you more happy to love your brothers and sisters in the faith? Are you more happy to be seen by others as loving, that you're loving them, but you're not loving those who don't respect you? What do you know? The story's not about the guy in the ditch. The story is about the lawyer not loving the Samaritan, and Christians are looking for the man in the ditch so we can bandage him up, and we can pray and get a hotel room for him. And Jesus twists the story and says, but you, can you love anyone? Even the one that disrespects you, even the one that you know doesn't believe like you believe. Does this mean we're not supposed to care for the man in the ditch? No. We're supposed to care for the man in the ditch. But man, Jesus just slapped a lawyer in the face. He said, you want me to answer your question? I'll answer your question. It's the Samaritan that you despise. That's your neighbor. So why don't you go and love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your might, and your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Can I go deeper in this parable? Because I believe when Jesus tells these parables, he's teaching us a whole lot of things. And we just don't necessarily know it because we don't see it from Jesus' perspective. I want to ask you the question. You'll know the answer to this. Who comes to steal, kill, and destroy? Satan. He is the thief. He is a robber. John 10.10. 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. The Samaritan came upon a man who was destroyed by a thief. So who's the Samaritan? 
The answer to who the Samaritan is in the story, you're going to love this, Luke 10, 33, 35, the answer to who the Samaritan is is based on what he did. What did the Samaritan do? But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, do you ever wonder, why are we getting all this detail? If the guy's laying by the side of the road half dead, why didn't the Samaritan just pick him up and take him to the hotel and say, take care of this guy? Why do we have to know that he used this, and he used this, and he put this much money up? Listen, but the Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him, and he bandaged his wounds. He poured oil on him, and he poured wine on them, and he put him on his own beast, and he brought him to the inn and took care of him. What did he give the man in need? First, he gave him compassion. Then he came to the man and he brought him bandages to heal his wound and he gave him oil. That's the Holy Spirit. And he gave him wine. That's the blood of Christ. And he carried them on the burden of carrying was uh, the burden of carrying was on the Samaritan. Christ had to carry the burden. He brought him to the shelter, the inn to be taken care of. That's getting him into the kingdom of God. Listen to me. On the next day, he took out two denarii and he gave Gave them to the innkeeper. Why two? Why not three? Not at five? Why not one? He gave two denarii to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever you spend, when I return, I will repay you. What is a denarii representing in this story? It is representing a day's wage, Matthew 20, 1 through 2. For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for himself. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into the vineyard. So what is he saying? Jesus is saying this guy is going to need to be taken care of for two days. And after the two days, I will return. Some of you are ahead of me. What's going to happen with the Samaritan? He's going to return on the third day. Oh, no, it gets better. Because now we go to Hosea chapter 6. Hosea chapter 6, I've taught on this before. It says, come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us after two days, and he will raise us up on the third day that we may, watch this, that we may live before him. Uh, I don't know if you saw it. Hosea is saying that the Lord will be gone for two days, but he will return on the third day. Now listen to me. A day in the Bible is how long in years? A day is like a thousand years. So what is Hosea saying? He's going to be gone for two days. He's going to be gone for 2,000 years, but he's going to return on the third day. Hello. If you have an ear, hear what he's saying. Who are we talking about the Samaritan is? Jesus. The Samaritan is doing everything that Jesus is. So what is he saying to the lawyer? You're my neighbor. Not only do you not like the Samaritan, you don't like me. I came to seek and save the lost and you had me in the scriptures and you denied me. You're so entrenched in the law and yourself that you cannot see that I am here to save you, to heal you, to deliver you into the kingdom of God and then return for you on that third day in that millennial reign. Jesus sums this whole thing up actually in John chapter 5, 39 through 47. He's talking to a lawyer and he says this, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Isn't that the question? What do I need to have eternal life? What does the law say? How do you interpret it? You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It's these that testify about me. And you're unwilling to come to me so that you would have life. The lawyer is asking about eternal life. Jesus is asking him what's written in the law. How do you read it? Can you comprehend, lawyer, what's going on right in front of you? Verse 41, I do not receive glory from men, but I know you that you have not had the love of God in yourself. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you'll receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and yet you do not seek the glory that is from the own, one and only God? Do not think I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses. The law accuses you, in whom you have set your hope. You are looking in the law for your hope, lawyer. 
For if you believed Moses, the law, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe in my words? What did Jesus just do? A lawyer asked him a question, said, who's my neighbor? He said, lawyer, you don't love the Samaritan because he doesn't like how you interpret the law, so you reject him. He's your neighbor. Oh, and by the way, guess what? I'm your neighbor too. And you reject me because you're looking in the law where it clearly talks about me, and yet you reject me when I come. Jesus is masterful with words. He is amazing with how he communicates, and I get constantly amazed by the revelation that's in the things that he says because I know there's more I'm not seeing. Honestly, Jesus is probably laughing at me today saying, you just figured that out. (laughs) It's right there the whole time. So what do we need to draw out of the Good Samaritan story? The law, your works will not save you. You can believe what you're doing is right, and Jesus can tell you you're wrong. The entire law was about Jesus. Look for him in the law. I'll say this over and over and over until I'm done with speaking in front of people, which I'll be dead when that happens. But anyways, the Old Testament is always always a physical representation of a spiritual concept in the New Testament. If you can't grab it in the New Testament on a spiritually appraised level, then you go back to the Old Testament and say, show me how this played out in the physical so I can understand how it plays out in the spiritual realm. Oh, I get it. I see your people were in bondage to sin in Egypt and you sent them a savior named Noah, uh, Moses, who is going to take them into the kingdom of God or the promised land. So spiritually, I understand why Jesus came to save me from sin and take me into the kingdom of God. Always a physical representation. And Jesus is in every story. Every story in the Old Testament, Jesus is in. And then I think we have to learn what it means to love everybody, even those who don't agree with our faith. Even those who believe we have interpreted scripture wrong, we have to say, but you're my neighbor and I I love you. I think it's easy to talk about. I think it's easy to decide we'll love people. But I don't mind saying even as a pastor, there are people I view as very self-righteous. And I think I don't even want to talk to you because you're just going to try to prove something in the flesh that you don't understand in the spirit. And in the middle of saying that, I realize I'm the arrogant one. Because God is good. Stand to your feet, please. I'm going to ask my altar ministers to come forward. Here's what I would ask you to do today. And it's going to be a very, very specific request because I think that's what this parable calls for. I believe God knows who we're struggling with. I believe God knows the enemy that we're calling an enemy in people when the truth is it's what the enemy's doing in the people that we're calling enemies. Did you stay with me on that? There are some times when you're upset with somebody and it doesn't have anything to do with them. It has to do with what the enemy is doing in them to keep you upset with them. We've been talking for a couple weeks here because Jesus does a lot about forgiveness. I don't think we have to expose what Jesus knows. So I think there can be an opportunity for you to come and ask someone to pray with you that your heart could be broken, that your heart could be softened for someone you're struggling with. I don't want Jesus to come and say, yeah, that person, that's your neighbor I was talking about for you, Todd. That one there that bugs you, that's your neighbor that I was talking about for you. I want to learn to love even in the disagreement.
Father God, in Jesus' name, we just declare that you are Lord of all and that we trust you with everything. Would you come today and soften our hearts? Teach us as a lawyer to love the Samaritan who is our neighbor, those who disagree with us. God, could we get to a place where we let you sort it out instead of thinking it's our job to fix it? Holy Spirit, right now, I would ask you just to lay on our hearts. Who is it I'm struggling with? Who is it that I keep at a distance? Who is it that I've used the word boundaries to actually mean judgment? Who do I refuse to ever let in again because of a hurt of the past, even when they've repented? Who do I look down upon? Who do I think has an attitude that I don't want to put up with? Who is my Samaritan, God? Holy Spirit, could you just lay the name of that Samaritan on our heart and let us repent and say, just teach me how to love him, God. You're not asking me to be perfect. You're asking me to be honest so that you can begin a great work in me. We love you, God, in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.